Look at this feast. We made it all by ourselves. She made it. She bought it though. I was there. <laughs> Cheers. Happy episode number five, six, six, episode number six. Are we keeping count? Yes. Welcome back to another true crime dinner party Woo! with your favorite YouTube hosts, Vita, Jackie, and Quinn. She down there. You saw her earlier. What are you eating? Uh oh, deviled eggs. <laughs> mm. Okay, so I don't know much about the topic. What's interesting is that at a small barbecue, get your face out of the, get your face out of our barbecue. <laughs> at a small barbecue, here at this house, a girl was telling us a story There's about. Here in the middle. A girl was telling us a story about a horrific crime that occurred near her hometown in Texas. And I thought to myself, that this can't be real. And she said it happened like in 2018, like it was a recent. And she's like casually going through the cliff notes of what occurred in the kitchen. And I was like, Jackie, this is our next episode. And so Jackie did all the research. I did none and I did Google it. I sent her the Google search page, but I purposely didn't read anything. I read one headline. What was the headline you read? The headline I read said, Texan couple adopts an African girl and keeps her as a slave for 14 years in secret. That's a good headline. It's horrible. It's horrifying. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I, I'm, I'm assuming it's accurate. There's accuracy there. Okay. We're gonna delve in. Anyways, I just couldn't believe like small talk, cocktail, you know, chatter. And this woman was talking about her hometown. She said it so casually. Yeah. I know. Well, we were talking about uh, crime things. And so what we're doing. Yeah. Like, yeah. Hey, it was posh at, guys. We're doing this thing yeah. for fun. Yeah. So it was, oh, yeah. I got a it was, uh, it was heavy. I made zucchini pasta. Yes, you did. So you also gave me though. a dangerous fork. A dangerous fork? Yeah, see how one piece sticks out? This is how you like... Here. No, 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 I'll use it. I was just saying... <laughs> what are we, five? Yes. No, but in a restaurant, you can't serve forks like this because you can... Well, this is... I'm... Five stars? One star. Three. I'm sorry for the Yelp review. At least three stars. <laughs> By the way, how was your week? My week was good. It was a little hectic. It was my husband's birthday. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Happy we did. birthday to Kai. What'd you do? I asked him to be a guest star and he said, no. <laughs> and then we went to Disneyland. Oh, yay, Disneyland. Cause we're a bunch of 10 year olds. I see posts on Instagram all the time of adults at Disneyland. Like people I worked with, mm -hmm. my friends, you know, it's very normal. Thanks for asking, my week was hectic. My week was bananas. That was your week. My week was crazy, thank you. I'm sorry. It's okay. So, I have a job in sales, but I have a lot of operational things too. And my operational support person quit like a month ago or so. And then I got a new one, like temporary. And on Friday, I was told at 2 p.m. PST that he was no longer working at the company. Right in the middle of chaos, of course. <laughs> and like my whole Friday afternoon fell apart right around two o'clock. It was terrible because I do operations. So I still don't exactly know what you do. Front. She's in shipping. Well, I was going to say if there's any front friends fans out there, I always say like, I'm like the Chandler Bang of every, what do you do conversation? Cause no one can ever remember the title of my job. They're like something in an office with a computer and truck. Yeah. All right. Okay, shall we get to the story? <laughs> you know, boots are very handy, actually. This is a great wiping platform. Very round, gets all the curvatures of your hand. She's so sexy, isn't she? <laughs> is that what we're going for right now? Yes. <laughs> I just want everyone to know that I'm completely sober right now. And that I hope now that at some point I am more tipsy but not hiccuping, because I really don't want to repeat that. That was humiliating. <clears throat> you want to read the title? I titled this as The Suburban South Lake Slave 
scandal. So I did this a little differently than the way we usually do because the more I read about the story, the more I uncovered bits and pieces and facts and sides where I was like, e mm -mm, who's not saying that any of this is good, <laughs> but like really what's happening. Does that make sense? Uh huh. Because I, I could feel there's two very distinct arguments to be made about the situation. And granted, the headlines are very sensational, okay. as headlines tend to be. Mm -hmm. But I'm just curious to like take you on this story and see how you feel about it and how your opinions sway. I love that. So, I have barbecue sauce in my wrist. I just cut that. And on your booby. <laughs> so, I formatted this like a trial. Okay. So I'm telling one side first. Okay. And then we're gonna tell the other side. Oh, a tr like a trial. Yeah, in because this room. went to trial. When you said trial, I thought you meant like a trial for our YouTube channel. <laughs> like a trial episode. And I was like, okay, we're gonna put it online though. It's not a trial. Court trial. I love that. <laughs> I'm gonna put lipstick on. I also have floss if you need it. She naturally, I'm like, she naturally has nice lip color, I don't. I can do something really creepy with my mouth. I'll show everyone. Only ex-boyfriends know this. Oh dear. Looks like a butthole. <laughs> uh, special skill. Should we put the fire on? Oh yeah, I forgot about the fire. Yeah, it's really hot. Ah! The suburban South Lake slave scandal. The scandal. A girl brought to Texas from a West African village as a child spent 16 years working in forced servitude for a well-off South Lake couple who abused her, kept her from attending school, and didn't once celebrate her birthday. Oh, that I know there's a random fact, but no, it's like the just birthday stings. <clears throat> the accused, Mohammed Toure and Denise Florence Cross Toure. I don't know how to say that last name. I think it's like Frenchish. Well, no mo volu per francais. <laughs> I think that was so not even close. <laughs> um, Mohammed Tour. Is it Tour? 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 And Tour. Denise Florence Cross Tour. Sure. So I'm probably going to call them Mohammed and Denise. That's what I did. I did all first thing. I love you. You already know my dyslexia. We're an elite couple in an affluent suburb of Dallas, South Lake. Both Muhammad and Denise were natives of Guinea and descendants of politically powerful families. So this is an African couple? Mm -hmm. okay. Muhammad's father was Am Ahmed Sekou Toure, sorry, the former first president of Guinea, where he was herald as a hero for the seizing of their independence from France and served for <gasps> oh, are no. we starting this already? <laughs> oh no. I have an indigestion. And served for 26 years until his death in 1984. His grandfather was also regarded as a national hero in Africa for having unified diverse groups to form the empire that would ultimately resist French domination. Contrary to Western media's depictions of African presidents, Ahmed Siko Toure shunned excess, prioritized education, and positive cultural values, which moved the society towards one that provided for its citizens and eradicated exploitation, especially of women. So it's showing that he's a good president. Hey, he sounds like a good guy. Yeah, he's a great guy. He wasn't like one of those, you know, Trump Scotland kind of people. Oh, oh Trump. Trump? <laughs> We're a first world country, I swear. Mm -hmm. He was reared in a strict home, raised around ordinary Guinean children and mm -hmm. and matriculated no. and matriculated through countries not through the country's national education system. Mohammed earned a bachelor's of <laughs> wow, that was beautiful, I might say. I think that's the best one you've ever done. I don't know if I've burped on the show before. 
you have. I think you just edited it out. <laughs> Probably. I wanted to stay classy. He earned a Bachelor of Economics degree and after graduation worked at Guinea's Ministry of Finance. I had a guinea pig once. Denise's mother was a sec- I just think of it every time I say guinea. I'm like, guinea pig. Alright. Denise's mother was a secretary and her father was Marcel Crowe, Guinea's Minister of International Cooperation. She was raised in an extended family household, typical of many African children and Crow family. And the Crow family, or Crows family, was well known for providing refuge in their home for orphans and others in need. Wonderful home. Yeah, they're making them Wonderful sound- Wonderful family. Yeah, like nice people. Yeah. I love your eyeshadow. It's really pretty. I don't know if you guys can tell, but it's like dark and then it gets lighter. It's very pretty. After the... What's that word? <laughs> <laughs> coup d'etat. After the coup d'etat. That's like coup d'etat. Coup d'etat. Coup d'etat in Guinea that followed the president. It's a hard word though. Uh-huh. Well, did, it's, it's not did. an English word and I don't speak French, so. <laughs> After the coup d'etat in Guinea, that followed the president's death in 1984, the country was no longer de deemed a safe place due to political turmoil. Muhammad, at the age of 23, was imprisoned along with his surviving family members and political party and held for nearly four years. After his release in 1988, he seeked safety in the neighboring Ivory Coast, and while there, he gained sponsorship for graduate education in the U.S. at the University of Dallas, Texas where he earned a Master's of Business in Administration. Meanwhile, Denise was already in the U.S. completing a bachelor's degree, waiting for her hubby. The two had met previously through political networks, but it was during this period of exile that they reconnected, got real sexy, remarried, got married. I'm adding things she She's paraphrasing. <laughs> got married and started a family. They had five kids. Both were officially granted asylum in the U.S. in 2000. So there's these two beautiful passport photos of the accused. I'm just kidding. They're mug shots. And their eyes are very welled and wet. It's like, it looks like they're very sad. They were often featured in the Dallas Morning News for their philanthropic support of various causes, including African businesses and organized culture festivals. However, investigators found little to no work history for Muhammad, which is very suspicious, who appeared to receive income from significant overseas deposits. Were they anonymous as well? We don't know. At one point in the early 90s, Denise once operated an exotic furnishings store in Dallas with a partner, Jan Showers. It was said that she and Jan had important connections Invoking the names of cross tours, father and father-in-law opened doors and cut through bureaucratic red tape. What does all that mean? What is my dad is very powerful. He can't do nothing to me. My daddy is so and so. Oh, go about your business through man. their exotic furnishings store. I don't That's what made them. Sold. You think it was like front business? I don't know. Maybe they sold like elephant tusks or something. From like I don't they're like know. we're I'm African selling authentic African. All I found was like African goods. Oh, so maybe it was like you know just clothes and pottery and stuff, but like no furnishings. You're probably right. It probably is like animal no. heads. You know, mm. the fact that the investigation was like we were able to cut through certain tapes makes me feel like they weren't just opening up a normal mom and pop shop. Yeah. Because why would you need to cut through bureaucratic red tape if you wanted to sell like rugs and stuff, you know? Uh-huh. Wait, did you only eat two ribs? No, I had three. I ate four. Good for you. Yeah, good for me. All right. Anyways, let's get back to the story. <clears throat> <laughs> the accuser. According to reports from the victim, do you know how to pronounce that? So I think it's Jaina. It's spelled D G. <laughs> D-J-E-N-A D-J-E-N-A um, But remember that movie Django? 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 Django Django! <laughs> yeah, Django <laughs> Jenna 
Jenna, okay. So Jenna Diallo was the oldest of three sisters born to a farmer family. They lived in a hut with a dirt floor and no indoor plumbing in a small village in Mondiana, Guinea. She remembers helping take care of her two younger sisters and attending school, but opportunities for advancement in her hometown were minimal. Her parents had also lost two children previously and struggled to provide for the three that they had. Sometime before the year 2000, her dad brought her to Guinea's capital to live with other relatives, where she worked for the Cross Tours family. In January of 2000, she was taken to an airport and put on a flight to the United States. The report claims that she was sent, what are you doing? The report claims that she was sent against her mother, Malado, Malaho, why are you laughing at me? Malaho <laughs> Diallo's, oh, you're laughing at yourself. Uh, by, uh, she was sent against her mother's wishes and tried to hide, and tried to hide her to prevent her from being taken because she didn't want her to become someone's slave. The girl's passport and visa said that she was only five years old at the time, although there are other documents that indicate that she may have been as old as 13. She did not speak English and only a limited amount of French. When she was put on the flight, she was alone and recalls that she did not know what was going on. What she does remember is a kind flight attendant who gave her cookies and a toy. Upon arrival to the Texas home, she was introduced to the other children, um, and, and to, to, to remind everyone, the Texas home is of Muhammad and Denise. She was introduced to their children as a cousin who had moved in and, as, and was, um, <clears throat> and as the eldest child of their household, considered to be the senior child. The victim claimed she was quickly put to work by the couple. After the family and the five children would leave for school in the mornings, she would start cleaning, making the beds, and vacuum. Oh, there's more. Not only vacuum. She would cook and garden and would continue to work until the children went to bed in the evening, all without payment. I don't know about you, but if like a cousin visits my family, mm -hmm. you know, they don't do any of that. They don't do any of that. No, they don't. They get spoiled. But then on the flip side too, totally playing devil's advocate here. If you're considered and treated as a family member, I wouldn't expect to get paid either. What? She had to do work. Well, okay. And she didn't get sent to school. Think of how old she is. That's true, that's you true. You can't forget that's the true. age. That's true. This is not a 20 year old. She was between five and 13. Right, she's a child. She should have been in school. She should have been in school. But do you pay a child who's between five and 13 for doing chores? No, I think that whoever wrote this Ugh. didn't consider it <laughs> well i also wrote this as a testimony oh that's right trial. you so this is from her perspective right so lots so to unravel so here this is what she said through the through even her at her arrival denise made it apparent that she was not like the other children she immediately put a relaxer on her hair uh to attempt to make it like straight in case you don't know what that means and when she didn't like how it looked she told Muhammad to shave it off which is awful because that type of hair texture takes forever to fucking grow it's traumatizing it's traumatizing for any woman to have their head shaved hair is such a sensitive identity it is it's like when you break up with someone you're like I'm gonna cut my hair growing up she wasn't allowed to play with other children. She wasn't taught to ride a bike, drive, or use a computer. She wasn't allowed to share any of the towels and could not mix her clothes with the other kids' laundry. She said she cooked meals, but was the last to eat. She never had a birthday party, and the victim says that she is unsure of her own age. That's crazy. This is super Cinderella-y. Yeah. I don't know my age. Yeah, I don't know my age either. She told investigators that for years she slept on the floor in one of the children's bedrooms and was given old clothes to wear. This is totally abuse. 
She claimed that the couple abused her both physically, verbally, and emotionally, often at the hands of Denise. Slapping gave way to being hit with a belt, or later an electrical cord from a boombox. So specific, right? She tried to choke me multiple times, Jenna said. Oftentimes when being beat, Jenna would try to block the blows with her hands and arms. One time, Muhammad intervened, but to prevent her from defending herself, he sat on my back while she was hitting on me. Hitting her. Hitting me, not hitting on me. Oh, I'm so sorry. It was sinking in what I read, but not the hitting on me part. That was just like automatic response. While she was hitting me. So he sat on my back while she was hitting me. Sorry. She told the jurors. When Denise's hand was injured, she told one of her sons to hit Jenna instead. And so he did. On another violent occasion, Denise ripped an earring out of her left ear. Federal agents noted several scars on the girl's arms and on her ear. The girl said the couple would yell at her frequently, calling her a little nothing, worthless, a dog, a slave, and a whore. She would also sometimes get kicked out of the home as a punishment and would sleep in nearby Bicentennial Park. She remembers huddling in a public restroom and using the hand dryer to keep warm. A South Lake officer who encountered her in the park in 2002 described her appearance as unkept. One time, Denise said, I smelled bad and she took me outside and hosed me off. Oh, these little details like really kind of jab, don't they? It's just like really inhumane and disgusting and I just don't know how you get off on treating an actual human being that right. way unless like it's ingrained in you right. in your and culture. It's to and it's oddly specific. Like so it's like, I don't know, I don't, it's like a hard thing to pretend like they made up, you know? I know that could be loud, but you're loud when you eat it. <laughs> oh, okay. The Justice Department said that the couple had isolated her from her family, society, and prevented her from receiving any education while their own children attended school and even college. It was confirmed that the district did not have any records of the girl attending any school. Jenna reported that she had only ever visited a doctor's office once in her life. By 2015, Jenna said that she was having ups and downs, but sometimes things seemed normal. However, the following year, everything went downhill. Her punishments over things such as meals and dirty dishes grew fiercer. Once when Denise attacked her, even Mohammed and one of her sons had to pull her off as Denise told them they were being too easy on her. And finally, Jenna had had enough. What happens next? <laughs> um, how's my lipstick? surprisingly intact. Okay, great. It's a stain. If you guys ever want to eat ribs and keep sexy lips, hit me up. I'll send you the info. In August 2016, mm. she reached out to a former neighbor for help. Bridget Ajufo had moved to Houston in 2005, 11 years prior, but at one time was a family friend of the Torres. Bridget arranged for her daughter Christine to pick up Jenna, explaining that she needed help getting out of bad situation. The parents were out of town and only Jenna and one of the daughters were home. Christine drove her to a friend's house in Dallas and the next day continued to Bridget's house outside of Houston. She fled with only two bags of belongings, photographic proof of her time there and her travel documents, which were long expired. She was taken to a local YMCA, which then contacted the authorities. Christine would eventually spearhead the government investigation regarding Jenna's case. Muhammad and Denise never reported the girl missing. Ah, oh, there's such pieces of shit. I feel like if I was Muhammad and Denise, I'd be worried. Like, oh no, she got out, she's gonna tell on us. Of course, if you treat her like a daughter, like your oldest daughter like runs away from home, it doesn't matter what the cause is. You're like, hey, my kid's missing. But they didn't treat her like a daughter. Well, they didn't, but I'm saying for like appearances sake, they oh. were to say like, hey, she's our daughter. It sounds like you're taking a leak. <laughs> oh, it's all gone. This horrible couple was arrested in their home in 2018 in front of their whole family. No, I just, I just, 
add that in because I hope that's what happened. And face a federal charge of forced labor, conspiracy to commit alien harboring, and alien harboring. Conspiracy to commit alien harboring and alien harboring? Is that a typo? Which can be sentenced up to 20 years in federal prison if convicted. Both Muhammad and Denise vehemently denied allegations and refused any deal that would require them to plead guilty to the charge. That's a that's a stance though. That can't be like diminished, you know? Yeah, they obviously you, you don't take a plea deal for whatever reason. They you obviously like, believe no. their version of the story. Right. Where they justify abuse. So now we enter the trial phase. The defense. They rebuke what Jenna says. The couple's lawyer, Scott Palmer, sounds like a good guy, stated that the criminal complaint is riddled with salacious, oh, salacious, what a good word, salacious allegations, fabrications, and lies. It sounds like such a lawyer. I'm sorry, judge, but, <laughs> you know, this, 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 vic, this victim here is, uh, her story is riddled with salacious allegations, fabrications, and lies. It's clear to see, I'm sure the jury of the court can see today that this young lady is just a good actress. Razzle dazzle, smoke and mirrors. I don't know. Trials are always so like weird to me. I felt like I was a lawyer for me. Yeah. <laughs> my family is all lawyers, so it's in my blood. He disputed that the girl was five when she came to the US, had been sent under her father's wishes, and was certainly never enslaved, forced to do anything against her will, never beaten, never threatened. She was free to leave the house whenever she wanted, which Jenna also confirmed. The defense insisted the victim was always treated like a member of the family, each of whom had chores and responsibilities. She was given clothes, food, a bed, spending money, and gifts. He stated that she had social media accounts and was in contact with her family in Guinea. Jenna did post regularly to social media accounts, including Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, enjoyed dressing fashionably, participating at a loyal youth group and even became friends with a neighborhood boy. That's confusing. Mm. She traveled with the family to weddings, graduations, and other children's sporting events. She was allowed to babysit in the neighborhood for money and could use it to buy things for herself. She confirmed during questioning that she was also gifted a cell phone for Christmas one year. To the outside world, she appeared to be a member of the family yet they didn't report her missing. I mean, it's like these photos show that, they show that she's part of the family, they do. She is dressed nicely, she's smiling, she's like having a good time. You know, it's it's tricky. And I'm not like diminishing what she's saying or her no, but story. It's, it's but now it's, very it's much suspicious. more complicated, right? Yeah. This is an interesting case. Mm. There were dozens of neighbors and friends who also submitted support statements and testified on the behalf, on their behalf, describing the family as kind, loving, and generous. The tours were respected in the community and their children were academic, athletic achievers, popular, and well-liked by their peers and adults in the community. Hassan Diane, a family friend, was the first to testify at the trial. When asked what his reaction to the case was, he said he was shocked and described Jenna as the owner of the house. When asked what he meant by this, he elaborated she had a house key. She went to the bank to make deposits. She was like Mrs. Tour's daughter. I would have noticed if anything was wrong. Weird. It's very weird. Even three of the couple's children painted a different picture as they waved and smiled at their supporters during their court appearances. They told the court that Jenna had in fact become desperate to stay in the U.S. after learning that her father wanted her to go back to Guinea in order to give her away to the highest bidder for marriage. Their attorney said that that's when Jenna began telling certain neighbors and acquaintances her false version of the story. But like, okay, why would she say she's being abused if she didn't want to go back to Africa? Because I feel like if you're not in a good situation in America, then people would be like, oh, then go home. That's a fair point. I don't get it. That's an absolutely valid 
Fair point. Okay. According to the defense testimony, just months after her arrival in the U.S., her father, Fula Kali Diallo, felt that the time had come for her to return home to be married. Having spent time in the U.S., she would now be an appealing candidate. Although she was still a teen, she would be promised by her father to an older man, speculated to be a man in, uh, in his 70s. Uh, which is not unusual in many parts of Africa. However, this went against Tori's mantra against exploitative practices and decided that this was not in Jenna's best interest and refused to send her back. Who refused to send her back? Her parents. I'm so confused. They were like, we'll adopt you, we'll bring you to the US, you do some work for us. Wait, her the, parents? Uh, well, the Tories. Oh, okay. So and not, not her, her parents. Right, not her okay. parents, the adoptive Okay, okay, okay. wait. wait. So the, the good Samaritans. Good Samaritans, bring her in and say, okay. hey, you worked for our parents back in Guinea, so come work for us here, and da 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 da, and then her biological father, father is like, oh, you've worked in the US now, great. You're You'll a make a candidate. great candidate for a daughter okay. to like sell off. So now it says that when the Torres, mm -hmm. the Torres mm -hmm. refused to send her, right. according to the defense. To so the adopted that family. Jenna's father then refused to send her birth certificate, which was required for many official documentations and enrollment in the Texas school district. So this must be why she never got to go to school. Right. And I believe that too, because in the sense like, there's a lot of official documentation, right? Like getting your social security card, getting your passport, getting your whatevers. I feel like you have to show proof of- How did she get into the country? Visa. Oh. You can get in with a visa, but then your visa has to be renewed every so often. Yeah, and if she's never in public, then no one would know. Then you couldn't renew her visa either. Well, no one would find out that it's... Right. Yeah. According to one report in 2016, Jenna, an adult at this point, announced that she would like to return to Guinea to assist her father who had been traveling there frequently to rebuild the Democratic Party of Guinea, his father's party that ushered in Guinea's independence in 1958, which he considered his political responsibility. He was currently titled as the Secretary General of the country as of 2010. In support, the Torres secured a document from the Guinea Embassy that would allow her to travel and enrolled her in a training program in Senegal where she would take on additional skills before continuing on to Guinea. However, according to accounts, Jenna had other plans. Their youngest daughter recanted a terrible goodbye and then she simply walked out the front door. So in this one, the defense is saying that it was the same. It was just Jenna and their youngest daughter, but their youngest daughter said that it was a tearful goodbye. It was a very devastating, emotional. And this is when Jenna ran away because of abuse. When she left for good, when yeah. she got picked up by Christine. Right, right, right. So, so, so they're twisting it and saying she was, she had plans to go do this program right. in Senegal. Was, and but this is really, documented. Like she had documentation from the Guinea embassy. So she was getting set up to be able to go to the country. So maybe she saw it things. as a true out because she was like, oh, they're gonna actually let me leave. Hey, and they don't whichever way you so want to So they never I'm reported saying, her missing. I'm just saying it's confusing. Well, well if no, she was gonna they, go to Guinea, there would have been official, like, there would have been a plane, there would, you know, like, you wouldn't just Well, they're disappear. saying she was supposed to go to Senegal mm -hmm. first, and that she left, and this is when Christine, so if we're, we're tying together to two stories, mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. is when Christine picked her up. Correct. Yeah. And so they didn't file a missing persons report, because so they thought she went to Senegal. she went to Senegal. Perhaps, but I feel it's weird that if you were a family, that you would, like, hey, you're going off to college. But leave when we're not home and we're not here to like say goodbye to you. Like, I find that a little strange. It is strange. You know, because if it was like planned that she's gonna go to Senegal to like do training or whatever it is, I would be like, you're gonna do so great, honey. Yeah, yeah if you love the child, if you love her. You know, if you need anything, let me know. Yeah, truly. So I still find it a little, 
strange it the way strange. they recount it. During the trial, Muhammad remains stoic. At one point during cross-examination of Jenna, she was asked if it was fair that she could have made the decision to leave at any time. She replied, no, because I had no family. For the first time in Jenna's five hours of testifying, Muhammad showed signs of breaking down. He also told the federal judge that this is one of the hardest things he's been through, that they've all been through. We opened our home to everyone and our hearts. Denise never flinched during the trial, but added, we thought the truth would come out. The defense said that she betrayed them and has tried to destroy the family that took her in at the request of her father for a better life in the United States. <sighs> okay, so what if we just read it like this? So now how do you feel about the whole situation and having heard the defense's side? First of all, I love the way you set this up. This is so interesting. Good job. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I feel like I could see it two ways. I could see a girl potentially with a mental like problem developing all these lies and stories because she seeks control and just I don't know. No, I, I, yeah, that's exactly what the defense is trying to picture. Right, right? and they like, paint it very rebellious, well. Rebellious, and yeah, she's, she's just, just she's just know, a problematic human being. Problematic, or she's resentful. These, these people are victims. You know, exactly. Yeah. Like, oh, I had to do, I had to do all these things like a slave, and they're like, well, no, like these were chores, like all the kids in the family had to do, which was demonstrated. And then you show like photos, like she's having fun. She's getting gifts, like cell phones. She can leave the house whenever she wants. Um, you no, know what I've really troubles me too. is that the headlines say slave. And so I thought that's like- such a trigger word. Yeah, 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 I was like, holy shit. Right? She didn't, you know, like maybe it was like the girl that was in the basement in, right. in Austri totally, Austria. Totally different situation. Right, because that right? was, she was a slave. She was a slave. Yeah. She was locked down yeah. under like so, multiple but then locked doors. When they say she had social media accounts, I'm like, oh, she had, oh, she was in touch with the outside world. She's, she absolutely, she could she walk was, out whenever she wanted to. She yeah, could leave yeah. the house. She made her own money like as yeah. a babysitter. You know, like, yeah, they didn't pay her. Well, the she headlines, was a servant. She was a child yeah. doing chores. The headlines say she was a slave, which throws me off. Nowhere in here did she say she was a slave. No. Mm -mm. But the headlines. So it's tricky, right? Because we don't know the full story of it, too. Because she also said things like, they made me shave my head. They washed me off with a hose. They, like, made yeah. me sleep in a park. But then... And this is total devil's advocate. I'm not like diminishing victim accounts by any means here. But when I was a fucking rebellious like 13 year old, I ran away from home. Me too. And I slept in a park because I didn't want to come home. I like doubled down on the whole like, ooh, I want my parents to stress out, you know? And it's an okay argument because a lot of teenagers really can relate to running away. But you can't assume that there wasn't abuse because right. I would run away because of abuse. Sure. You know, and I would, I would hide in parks too, sure. but I was like crying and right. didn't want to go home because right. I was scared of my stepmom and stuff. So I ran away because my parents wouldn't let me go to the movies with the friends. So it's like, I would run away because my parents wouldn't let me see my mom. During the trial, the case was built primarily on testimony. There were no witnesses observing her being mentally or physically abused, but even questioning Jenna about her duties around the house, such as yard work, painting, and cooking. Jenna herself admitted that she enjoyed the activities and, her, and the work was shared by all of the tour children. There is criticism about the government's tactic about the government's tactics in their pursuit of conviction, which includes 20 armed agents deployed to arrest the Taurus. That's a lot. 20? Is it because they're from Africa? Just fucking assholes. The denial of a visa for a critical witness from Guinea to testify on their behalf. 
but didn't flow. There was a witness that would have come to testify on the behalf of the parents, but their visa was denied, so they never got to testify. Jenna's mother, however, was brought in to testify on her daughter, daughter's behalf through a translator. The topic of financial restitution came up and her mother said, I don't know about, I don't know anything about money. I only want my daughter. Both said that they were not expecting any money from the criminal case. Jenna's citizenship remained uncertain since her immigrant status was no longer protected by the government. But when asked what she wanted to do going forward, she answered she wasn't sure. She didn't know if she wanted to return to Guinea or stay in the US because she couldn't say whether her life here was better or not. Any of the kids testify? Well, three of the kids testified and they're all of various ages, so I don't know why the two who didn't testify didn't testify. Wait, I cannot speculate on that. But three were of the they kids, not, were they very young children? I, I think it was the older two who did not testify. Okay. But the younger three testified on their parents' behalf saying Jenna was like their sixth sister. She was here. She did chores like that. Okay, I want to speculate together. really quick. Yeah, speculate. The older two siblings hate their parents and were like, we're not going to be mixed up in this fucking bullshit. The younger three are like still seeking approval from their parents because they're still in the hook. And so they're like, yes, mommy, daddy, we'll do whatever you say. Potentially. I mean, who's to say, it's you fun know? to speculate. It is fun to speculate. Who knows? Who knows? All right. Yes. So who's guilty? I don't know. I can't tell. I mean, that's what makes I it I think so tricky, like if right? I could see videos of them, you know, then I could actually make a decision. Yeah. But just so like, I couldn't find any home videos, but I did find no, the photos. No, but the trial videos. Oh, the trial videos, right? But as far as like home videos go, I found the photos. And the photos were random and they were taken not just like what the parents provided, which I can see is biased, but also from our social media. Yeah, but you know? also you have to really consider that like people that get abused are abused by very clever people that know how to hide it. That's true. They were so, very educated. Yeah, so they probably were like, you're going to come out, you're going to wear this dress, you're going to smile, mm -hmm. and if you don't, we're going to send you back to the seven-year-old. <laughs> right, family. yeah, and so they were like, so you have a choice. You can either stay locked in this room when we leave. Yeah, that's that's totally or put that's on this totally, lace yeah. dress, smile, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. act normal. You know, like it if they're abusive, then they're yeah. capable of that too. Totally manipulative for sure. Yeah. And also like at a, such a young age, like five to thirteen, oh. whatever age she was, I mean that's grooming. Yeah. And that's that's Stockholm syndrome at mm -hmm. that point, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's all you ever know. All you know is your abuser. So you're like, yeah. okay, how do I navigate my abuser? Totally. How do I keep like, my abuser? You grew up in a hut that had dirt on the floors. We're giving you a toilet. Right. You might just be grateful. Or be told you should be grateful. Exactly. So it's very complicated. Continue. I oh. think the parents are guilty because this is quite a story to make up. You know, it's quite an accusation. It is an accusation. Okay. In January of 2019, federal judge Reed O'Connor sentenced the couple, both 58 at the time, seven years in prison each, and ordered them to pay the victim just over $288,000 in restitution. Their family house was forfeited, appraised at over half a million dollars, and after their prison term, they will also have three years of supervised release and they will like and will likely be deported back to Guinea. They are serving out their sentences in separate federal prisons and going through a lengthy appeals process to get their sentence overturned. They were found guilty. So I was right. So I did the math too, right? $288,000. It was actually 287 and change, but 288 divided by 16 was $18,000 a year. But children can't be paid. No, they cannot. So this is a good starting place. Mm -hmm. Like when I was 18, mm -hmm. I didn't have any money. 
So to think like having $280,000 to start my life, you can, that can last a very long time. It can. I don't can. think I've even spent $200,000 as a human being yet. I don't know. It's just a thought. Just a thought. I'm going to have some more vodka. Half more vodka. Just a thought. So you have these things written here. Which, should I read them? Yeah. Okay. A U.S. attorney, Aaron Neely Cox, said in a Justice Department statement, forced labor trafficking cases are notoriously difficult to prosecute, in part because victims are often afraid to speak out. Further complicating scenarios, the trial highlights tough choices that a rural village girl in Africa may face, which may consist of being married off to an older man or being sent to other countries for work. Jenna still lives with Bridget in Houston to this day and has a job working at Macy's. Oh, that's so cute. The one thing I think of is the statement that her mother gave. Oh, I don't God. want you, I don't want my daughter to go to America to become someone's slave. So there, there might be elitist cultural uh, stereotype mm -hmm. in New Guinea mm -hmm. where wealthy families take poor family's children mm -hmm. and make them house slaves, mm -hmm. even though it's the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Because I would be curious to look up if house slaves are still common in New Guinea. Mm -hmm. So there's a question of, should I Google it? Well, there's a question of, we need to delineate house slaves versus, I don't know what the word for this is, servants, house workers. Well, she's a child, so I don't think there's an mm -hmm. appropriate word for it. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of countries in the world that still do have a, um, and there are servants. It's normal in some cultures, like Africa or like India. What we Googled didn't turn any results, so we'll probably cut that out or just tell you that we can find yeah. anything. But I just wonder, because if the mom had it in the back of her head, I don't want my daughter taken to America by this wealthy, right, powerful, right. guinea right. couple. Right. But just because... they're going to make my daughter their house servant. Slave. Right. Servant slave. Yeah. But also devil's advocate. And once again, I'm not trying to be the asshole here, but just playing devil's advocate yeah, here. Yeah, advocate. What if they were like, because their their family like principles and ethics and upraisings and everything else show demonstrate that they did not believe in that exploitation, mm -hmm. right? So they were like, maybe we genuinely do want to bring in a kid and adopt her as our own to give her a better chance in the U.S. because we have this family that's been working for us in Africa, and we'd love to take one of, as we move to the US, we'd love to take one of them and give them a better opportunity. We're not gonna pay them, but we're gonna just raise them as one of our kids. Yes, they have to do the dishes. Yes, they have to do lawn work. Yes, they have to like, you know, Whatever it is that parents make kids do, like I had a shit ton of chores. I don't know. I mean, you know she, what I mean. She it's, came up with so many tough. She came up with so many details of how she was abused, like such. You said it specific, very oddly specific. Yeah, yeah very oddly specific. So the question is: Is seven years and two hundred eighty-eight thousand dollars, which I think for this family is not a lot of money, right? Do you think that's fair? Um, honestly, since it's so hard to prove, right? Mm -hmm. I think the fact that they got prosecuted and stopped mm -hmm. is great. Um, seven years? No, that's not equal to the amount of time that they punished this little girl. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, against all odds, yeah. they believed her story and... Like, I'm actually shocked. But then again, I did read these news article mm -hmm. titles that were very dramatic. So I kind of suggested that mm -hmm. the young girl was to be believed. 
And I, again, like, unless she could be identified as someone with a severe mental illness, who would make this shit up? That's fair. No, it that's is totally fair. fair. I mean, yeah, that's totally fair. It's fair because nobody, like, you'd have to really be inventive and, and quite, like, a manipulative young lady to make up this kind of accusation, to invent such a story, you know, and mm -hmm. for... The, for it to be, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm assuming that it's a fair trial that everyone was considering the rights of these African citizens, but maybe because they're not American citizens, you know, technically they're not born, uh, or I don't know, are they, they, they might be citizens because they lived here for so long, but um, I don't think she was ever granted citizenship up until no, the trial. No, the family. Oh, the family. No, they were granted asylum. Right, but the children were citizens because they were born here. Yeah, the children yes, were born here. they were born here. So the parents, you know, I was just, my train of thought was to say like, oh, they, you know, maybe the Texas jury was, you know, considering these to be a foreigner case, you know, maybe they, you know, like, imagine if it was, like, a true uh, American Texan family being accused mm -hmm. of this. You know, there might be more pride siding with the American Texan family. I am totally speculating, but it's just kind of where my brain naturally goes because I'm so used to racism and mm -hmm. stuff, you know, and mm -hmm. I'm just used to, like, especially in Texas, for there to be, like, small towns. Yeah. Like, racism. Yeah. Very present and... You know, I feel like a jury might jump at the chance to put two successful African adults yes. in prison. I can see that. Too, um, you sure. know, it's like it's a little hard because I can see the political bullshit part of it, the the racial, the racist part. Just of the it. biases. Yeah, the biases. Just the biases. But like, if this girl made it all up, like, fuck, that is crazy. It's quite manipulative. Inventive. I'd have a hard time if I was on the jury. Granted, I only have what I've gleaned no, off the internet. We, I don't have the facts facts that the right, lawyers have taken right. out and stuff. And I think when you see people in real mm -hmm. life, it's different. You see like, yeah. you see them, you know, you see right. like how right. they're acting. And that's a huge thing because yeah. we've had cases that we've talked about before where they were like, their affect was weird. And you're like, well, shoot like yeah like um, if something happened to someone that was very close to them and they didn't have any emotion i'd like, be like that's weird like our first episode the best friends yeah we watched the trial with um i think it's rachel yeah and she's totally torn apart she like, was it's clear so that devastated and then the other girl um stone cold yeah this case doesn't really say anything about whether jenna was upset or remorseful there wasn't a whole lot of references to like did she cry on the stand did she not they showed that her parents were stoic to a point and then they cracked and they broke down um so you have all these interesting facts here mm. so you wrote human trafficking is a 150 billion dollar industry i just want to draw attention to this is a real problem this yeah. is a one case, but this is an issue in the world that I'd like to draw attention to. Okay, this next fact uh, gives us a bit of an idea of the likelihood that this case was dealt with in the right way. Mm -hmm. Nearly 25 million people around the world are estimated to be modern slavery victims, according to the International Labor Organization, the UN agency that focuses on labor rights. This includes nearly 5 million who are sexually exploited and 16 million people in forced labor with nearly 4 million of them in domestic work. 71% of trafficked victims are women and girls. I believe that. 25% are in the age of 18. I believe that. The region that traffics the most victims is in the Asia Pacific region, which makes up about 15 million of that 62%. The second is Africa, about 5.7 million, 23%. The U.S. accounts for 1.2 million victims of the forced labor, 5%.
Of the estimated 16 million forced labor victims, only 1,038 cases were prosecuted globally. Whoa! That is a teeny tiny infant. That's nothing. Amount. Yeah. What's the fucking point? And, and that's knows. globally. 16 yeah, million. See that only a thousand, just over a thousand were globally prosecuted. In 2016, the U.S. Department of Justice convicted only 439 human traffickers, which is up from only 104 in 2015. Out of 16 million. Oh, uh, so they know. Okay, so how do they know how many there are, but they don't, they're not able to convict it? Like, that's just, is it because children go missing or people go it missing? It is arbitrary, and I don't know the answer to that question. I don't. I wish I did. But it could be that these are the number of cases that come forth or the claims that come forth or the women that they rescue and say, hey, like I've been a victim. I don't know. I think it's a little bit more than just like people who go missing, right? Because like I know in the US, like if you're a runaway or a disappearance, they probably wouldn't chalk it up as a trafficking incident. And that's not to say they were found guilty. That's just the ones that went to trial. That is a drop in the bucket of a problem that plagues people in the world, particularly women and children, but just in general. It's insane. Well, this was a really fun wild ride. It wasn't, fun. it wasn't as sad as I thought it would be because we don't really know what happened. I think it's interesting to see the different perspectives for change, right? Because we see all of these sensationalized headlines and the stories, but they're usually from like one perspective. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time that we've seen something where we see both sides of the story. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> there's a man and a dog. <laughs> it goes to show like how your opinion can be affected hearing both sides. At least mine was, you know? And I know there's this whole like movement of believe the victim and I do like 99.99% of the time, right? Like there has to be an honest evaluation of facts. And I think in this case, it really does make it a little bit a shade of gray. Yeah, no, it's totally confusing. You know, I don't, I don't know. It's a recent Whoa. case, it's a recent story. So, you know, there's gonna be updates. So, hey, what are you doing? No bark. So yeah, I mean, we can totally revisit this in a future episode if anything changes. Let's wrap this up. Um, <laughs> the food was delicious. The story was intriguing. The company was even better. And uh, thank As you always. guys for watching another episode of True Crime Dinner Party. Uh, uh, Yay! Uh, uh, Let us know uh, what you uh, think uh, and yeah. how you feel about the case, and if you find anything that's you know that yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you guys find anything on this story since it's so recent, put the link in a comment. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, thank you for joining us. Cheers. Cheers. Um, have a great evening. We hope that you had fun dining with us, drinking with us, whatever. I would say time for bed, but we're gonna go to a bar! <laughs> Don't forget to subscribe! Subscribe, 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 subscribe for more episodes. Ooh, did you good? You wanna see more of this cute little girl? Speak. No! <laughs> what? You did it! Night. Good night. Oh, what a good angle to say good night. Yes, good, good night. night. Good night. Uh, do we have to go to a bar? It was your idea to go to a bar.